Well, what's going on, Parkview? I uh, hope that you're doing well this morning. And I'll tell you what, this fall has been a fall like none other, as I'm sure that you've, as you've gotten a few weeks into this and nothing seems normal still. We're still in this season where things uh, just feel a bit off. And in a season like this, it might, you might be tempted to think that because maybe kids aren't going back to school and because uh, the fall has been what it has been, that maybe uh, things at church aren't moving the way that they've been in the past. But let me tell you, that could not be further from the truth. So as we start our service this morning, I just wanted to highlight a few of the incredible things that have started as we've launched this fall year, uh, this, into this fall season. And I think you're going to be encouraged by all the ways that God is still on the move uh, this fall. So, for instance, we've had uh, about 150 women sign up uh, for the women's study this semester. That's incredible. Uh, Nikki and Aleka have written this study that they're going to take women through uh, over the course of the next few months. And uh, the past few weeks, we've seen uh, them give out all these books and these bags to go along with the study. Uh, and there's so much energy and so much excitement around the opportunity uh, to grow together in the women's study. We've had over 80 people sign up for a class that Darcy and Ray are leading, uh, a class called Candid Conversations, and it's a discussion on race and reconciliation in, in the church. And it's kind of a new uh, thing for us to do this class all virtually. And so we've had, we had our first class this past week. And what is so cool about the class, in addition to the content and the 80-plus participants, is that we created a brand new, uh, brand new studio space at Parkview to record this class so that we can, we can really maximize uh, our content and our speakers and interact with each other. And so there's this brand new studio that we've been using. Uh, we're calling it the Yo. I don't know if we are or not, but we're trying to get that to, to take off the yo. It sounds really cool. You want to go record something in the yo? Okay, anyways, you get it. So we have this brand new studio space in which we're recording content and this class that has taken off. We have middle school ministry meeting on Tuesdays. We have high school ministry meeting on Wednesdays. We have a care and recovery still meeting on Mondays. I say all of this just to highlight the fact that despite this crazy season, and despite being in month five or six of this season, God continues to move his people and continues to draw people closer to him. Uh, we are not just coasting into the fall and throwing up our hands and saying, well, I guess we're in for a lame year. <laughs> that is not at all what you have been doing and what our leaders have been doing. And we are just so thrilled to see how God has moved our congregation this fall. And we're so, we're so thrilled to hear the stories of transformation that will come as a result of all these programs. Because programs are nice, classes are nice, Bible studies are nice, but at the end of the day, what we get excited about as a church is seeing people's lives transformed by the gospel. And we are so confident that God will continue to do that in our midst. And so we're just going to celebrate this morning all of the ways in which God uh, is moving here at Parkview. So I'm going to pray for us as we start our service. God, you are so good, and despite the season that we're in, you continue to show up in incredible ways, new and exciting ways. And so for all of these things that we've mentioned, and there are others that have started this fall, that are engaging our people, that are getting our people excited about a new season with you, God, we pray that you would do something incredible through them, that in, in a few months from now, we would look back and say, man, that is not at all why I thought September, October, November were going to be. But I am so glad I took this step of growth in my relationship with Jesus. So God, would you do that in our midst and we'll give you all the praise and all of the glory. We pray this all in your name. Amen.
Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, we praise your name. Oh, we bless your name, Lord. Throw up our hands and worship to you, God. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for the King. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. God, you deserve every single hallelujah. I'm so, so grateful, God. Grateful for the ways that you show up in each of our lives daily in the blessings that we will have already overlooked, God. But right now in this moment, we are grateful. And we express that gratitude by joining in with the angels who encircle your throne, singing holy, 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 declaring hallelujah. You are worthy, God, and I am grateful. Thank you for the gift of Jesus who makes all of this possible life in you, freedom in you. We offer our gratitude and our hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to tell you a story of what God has been doing through Parkview and specifically through the collective in Villa Park. You know, our team this summer started to think about the fall. And they started to realize, okay, this fall is going to be different. And it seems like there's a good chance that the district isn't going to allow volunteers to come back into the buildings. And most of the programs that we do take place at uh, the schools that we serve. And so they started to brainstorm about what it, might be, uh, what it might look like to serve the community and to serve the students with having to drastically change their program. And so they were prepping for that. Chantel and Allison were prepping for that. And then as the date got closer, they started to realize, well, it's starting to look like no one is going to be allowed back into these buildings. It looks like the district is going to go to e-learning. And so once again, Allison and Chantel brainstormed and prayed and asked God, what would the collective look like in this season? Uh, and you heard a little bit about this from Chantel a few weeks ago. But I want, I'm standing here uh, as we completed our first week of this uh, new ministry, and I want to just share a little bit about what uh, it has looked like. So we partnered with the district to say, we know that we know that students are going to, there are some students that are going to struggle with e-learning. In fact, the, the, the schools told us that. And that has already become true within the first few weeks. They, they told us that there are a large number of students that aren't turning in their work. Uh, they're having a hard time staying on track and staying motivated to do their work as they work online. And so... Uh, Chantel and Allison made some, some pretty strategic decisions uh, in a really short amount of time that they were going to offer this thing called the Collective Academy, uh, which was going to serve students uh, uh, while they e-learned. 
And so they worked to try and secure a location, because again, we can't use the schools, uh, in which the Collective Academy was going to take place. And they found a church in Villa Park, um, Christ Covenant, in which they, are, they launched the first uh, round of the Collective Academy this week. And they had seven students be with them for the majority of the day as they completed their work. In addition to Chantel and Allison, we hired a a certified teacher to be a part of that. We also had the privilege of making Chantel full-time. And I say privilege because for the past year, she's been working uh, on a part-time basis. And as we looked forward to what was going to be the challenge of this year, we said we need uh, Chantel full-time because she is such an asset and she is an incredible uh, organizer, communicator, uh, community builder. And so she decided to come on full-time. And so we have this team that's working with these seven students. Uh, But in addition to those seven students, we have capacity for 30. And so we've been working with the schools and the principals to identify which students need uh, a little more attention that might benefit from the Collective Academy. And right now, the team is working with the district to to identify those kids uh, so that we can serve even more. So we have a capacity for another 20 or so kids. And in addition to Christ Covenant, uh, Chantel and Allison have worked on securing another location at New Hope Church in Villa Park, in which is going to be our second location for the Collective Academy. We're going to be able to partner together with this church, do some renovations to their building to kind of get it ready for this new endeavor. And the reason I'm telling you all this is because I'm just, A, I'm so proud to be a part of a church and to be a part of uh, this community that is really pivoted kind of on the fly to make this happen. But I tell you this also to say it's making a significant difference. I mean, the fact that we're providing kind of one-on-one attention to to students as they navigate a a really tough season, I mean, the, the 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 credibility that we already have with the district just continues to go up as we step into the gap and fill these needs. I also say that because I wanted to thank you for your generosity. We ran this Equip a Child drive in which we asked for supplies uh, to help us as we launched the academy. And you showed up like you always do and brought in supplies and brought in all sorts of things so that we could allow the Collective Academy to be a success. Lastly, I just wanted to, to say that as well as just to remind you to pray. As you pray for your own kids your own neighbors and your own nieces and nephews and cousins and things that are are going back to school, please continue to pray for our students in Villa Park. Pray for Chantel and for Allison and for the others on the team that we're uh, trying to serve uh, and just trying to be a resource however way that we can help uh, because it really is a a pretty incredible opportunity. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is is a verse from Galatians that says, uh, don't grow weary of doing good. And I think that's a really important verse. It's a verse that's really impacted me over the years because I'm, I, I'm, I'm always struck by the fact that there are, there's never a shortage of opportunities. We're never going to run out of things to do in the name of Jesus. There are never, there's never going to be a shortage of needs uh, to meet. And so I think that verse and that encouragement from the Apostle Paul makes a lot of sense because as you look at the list of things to do in the world, of the ways to serve, the ways to engage, it could, you, it could be overwhelming. Uh, and as you seek to serve and to be a light in this world, it you could grow tired, like legitimately tired. And so the encouragement to not grow weary from doing good, and I just think it's important that it's added from doing good because there are other things that we'll grow weary from, and some of those things maybe are even appropriate to grow weary from. But the encouragement and the challenge is to not grow weary from doing good because there's never a shortage of opportunities. And Parkview and the collective has consistently um, not grown weary. And they continue to show up. And so I wanted to say thank you. And I also wanted just to pray a prayer of thanks and blessing over the Collective Academy uh, as they continue their work. So let's pray together. God, we're so grateful for Allison and for Chantel and for others that are on the team, volunteers and others that are working um, their hardest, working uh, to creatively serve Villa Park. And as this season has brought with its its challenges, we're so grateful that it has also brought with it unique opportunities. and unique, uh, a unique position to help students as they e-learn. And so we just ask that you uh, use the spaces that we've had, use the partnerships that we've created uh, to continue to serve kids. And as we do that, they would realize that we do that because we love you and because we love them. And so we pray this all in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again. I hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, if you have your Bibles nearby, why don't you open them to James chapter 2. As most of you know, we're in a series right now called Reflections, and we're looking at this letter written by James, who, uh, in case you didn't know, was a son of Mary and Joseph, and therefore a half-brother of Jesus. 
And can you imagine that? I mean, can you imagine having a sibling who claimed to be son of God, deity in the flesh, savior of the world? I mean, what do you say to that? How do you react to that? Well, you know from Scripture, James wasn't buying it. The Apostle John says he was a skeptic. And I'm guessing when people started saying, hey, we believe your brother is the Messiah, James was like, trust me, I grew up with the guy. We shared a bathroom for years. No way is he the anointed one of God. But over time... You know, James not only witnessed Jesus' compassion, his teaching, and his miracles, he also witnessed Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, after which James became a follower. And that's why he opens his letter referring to himself not as uh, a servant of God and my best bro, J.C. No, he says, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus the divine Messiah. So clearly James came to recognize who Jesus was and what he came to accomplish for all of humanity. He was a true believer. And so along with Peter and John and Matthew and the rest, he became a leader in the Christian community. But early on, James noticed some things were were happening in the church that needed to be addressed. And keep in mind, uh, the, the whole church thing at this point was pretty new. So new, in fact, there hadn't been enough time for false teaching to even creep into the ranks. So when it came to Jesus and the gospel, you know, the good news of God's love and grace, people in the church got that. Their problem wasn't theological. They had the right information, they said the right things, they affirmed the right teachings, but a serious disconnect existed between what they they said they believed and how they actually behaved, and that was the problem. And so James, in his letter, he presses this idea that genuine Christianity is not just about having accurate theological information. It's not just about what you know to be true. It's about how you live and how that truth is making you more and more like Jesus. So that said, at the time, some in the church uh, were behaving in a way that was just completely out of line with who Jesus was and what he taught. And so James confronts the church on it. And he writes, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there, you sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You know, every so often when we read scripture, we come across certain texts that are hard to interpret. Uh, this is not one of them, okay? What James says here to the church is pretty clear, namely that showing favoritism toward, uh, toward uh, one person or one people group over another is wrong. Whether you base that favoritism on somebody's looks, their culture, their skin color, their language, education, economic status, it makes no difference. As followers of Jesus, withholding welcome and care and compassion and kindness to someone out of prejudice and bigotry has absolutely no place in the church. And that's, that's really what James is talking about here, prejudice and bigotry. You guys know the difference, right? Prejudice means to negatively prejudge someone without really knowing them. Bigotry is prejudice in action. It's d- discriminatory behavior that's you know, arrogant and pre- uh, contemptuous, not to mention extremely painful for those being treated that way. Well, James saw how some in the church were discriminating against the poor because of how they looked, the way they dressed, and what they didn't have, money. Or put another way, they were showing preference to those who were wealthy and well-resourced, and James condemns it as wrong. In fact, he uses much, much stronger language. He calls it evil. He says to Christians, he says, look, if, if you show favoritism specifically to the wealthy over the poor, Have you not discriminated and become judges with evil thoughts? And his his language here is interesting because because it carries this idea of political corruption. In other words, he's saying, if if you guys privilege one class or cultural group over another, you're acting like shady public officials who take bribes. And so he says, don't do that. It's morally wrong. It's evil. And the term evil there was a term used of malignant disease. Oh, please understand, you know, James wasn't criticizing wealth or those who had it. He wasn't disapproving of any, anyone owning nice clothes or fine things. There's nothing morally wrong with that. 
What's morally twisted, however, is, is treating people who have money and have resources and influence better than those who don't. You know, showing preference to individuals, families, or people groups who have a lot while marginalizing those who don't have a lot or as much. And James just outright condemns that. He condemns all attitudes of prejudice and or acts of discrimination in the church, whether, whether individually or corporately demonstrated. Because from its inception, you know, Christian community was, was one in which all people, men and women of, of every culture, every color and class, uh, were discriminately welcomed, loved, embraced, empowered, and treated equally. That's the way it's supposed to be. Anything less isn't just unfortunate. It's an evil malignancy. And let's face it, no one is immune. No one is immune to these sort of malignant attitudes of superiority that, that lead to treating others as inferior. Take the Apostle Peter, for example. As a Jew, uh, he carries some serious prejudices against non-Jews, and for a while he treated Gentile believers as sort of second-class kingdom citizens. He even started segregating himself and other Jewish believers away from them. But then he has this vision in which God made it clear to him that hate, bigotry, and racism are wrong. The result, Peter declares to leaders in the church, he says, I now realize God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation uh, the one who fears him. We heard that, right? God does not show favoritism. So here's a question. Do I? Do you? I mean, as you, as you look at people who are not like you, different culture, different race, different language, education, economics, do you hold prejudices? Do you, do you negatively prejudge people because of those differences? Because James says to do so is evil. But on the other hand, he says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing what's right. So what, what was James doing here? Well, very simply, he was explaining the scriptural basis as to why favoritism is evil. And think about it. He writes, if you really keep the royal law and scripture, you are doing right. Well, what's the royal law? He defines it, doesn't he? Love your neighbor as yourself. Here's my Ray K summary. God's will for us, his people, the church, is to love others unconditionally and impartially. In fact, James reminds his readers of two things here. First, he reminds Jewish Christians of the Old Testament, the Torah, the law, and how in it God commands his people to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The second thing he does is he quotes Jesus, who taught the exact same thing. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you recall the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus depicts our neighbor as who? Remember? Anyone we see who has a need. Even if it's someone we don't know or don't particularly care for or feel comfortable around. And let's not forget, Jesus also commanded, love your enemies, do good to them. But James wasn't just appealing to Jesus' teaching. He was also appealing to his life. Because tell me something, was Jesus an arrogant, discriminating bigot? Well, no. Right? Who was Jesus? Jesus was deity in the flesh who left heaven to be with us humbled himself for our sakes. He was born in poverty. His own race was oppressed and persecuted. His was a working class family from a tiny insignificant town. He never earned an educational degree, never commanded an army, never held political office, never wore fancy clothes or religious collars, never opened a bank account, rented an apartment, or owned a home. And I don't know about you, but when I think of Jesus in those terms, I realize that for me to show favoritism uh, toward or discriminate against anyone because of who they are, where they're from, what they look like, how rich, poor, educated they may or may not be, it's like saying I'm better than Jesus. And I most certainly am not. And neither are you. And when it came to loving people, uh, Jesus, he shattered gender, racial, socioeconomic, and cultural barriers because he loved, he loved Jews, Gentiles, Samaritans, and Romans, the rich and the poor, Politicians and prostitutes, criminals, the sick, the healthy, soldiers, slaves, free, sober, drunk. It didn't matter. Jesus rejected no one. I mean, the only people he really had conflict with was the religious elite who kept criticizing him, constantly criticizing him for hanging out with those that they consider those people, the riffraff, the low-life, inferior sinners. Understand, James wasn't just offering a personal opinion on this whole favoritism thing. 
He's saying that God has told us in the Old Testament and modeled for us in Jesus how we're to reject the evils of prejudice and discrimination and love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, as much as we love ourselves. And you guys have heard me say this before, a lot of times before. I love myself a lot. I really do. I mean, I love myself no matter, no matter what I'm wearing, uh, uh, no matter what I'm driving, how I smell, when I have money, when I don't have money, when I'm in shape, when I'm out of shape, with hair, without hair. I love myself unconditionally and impartially. And God says, hey, Ray K, that's how you're to love others. And God says to Christians, that's how you, you guys are to love others. And he says to us as a church, that's how we are to love others. So how's that going for us? Here's another question. What people group do you play favorites to? Or who is it that you stay away from or prejudge, mistreat, or discriminate against? Who is it? I mean, God already knows the answer, so just be honest with yourself. And when you figure it out, repent and stop it. Because we're called to love others as much as we love ourselves. I'm not saying that's easy. It's not. It runs against human nature. I mean, it's contrary to, to cultural norms and accepted social strata. But James says, if we, when we love all people unconditionally and impartially, we're being obedient to God, we're living in the way of Jesus, and we're doing what is right and good. Now, here's the caveat. Here's the warning James gives to the church regarding favoritism. In no uncertain terms, he says this. He says, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he, God in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament, who said do not commit adultery, also said do not murder. If you don't commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. And the term lawbreaker refers to someone who just willfully violates what they know to be right. So, what's James getting at with all this law stuff? Well, he's saying that favoritism is a big deal. It's a big deal to God. It's, it's evil. It's a sin. You know, as Christians, uh, we have a tendency to compartmentalize sinful behavior. You know what I mean? We do. We're, we're, we're inclined to kind of elevate one sin over another, maximizing some, minimizing the rest, at least in our own minds. Well, apparently the same was true of early Christians, which explains why James appeals to the law, because by doing so, he emphasizes the fact that whenever we sin, whenever we violate what God says is right and good, it's offensive to him, no matter, no matter what it is. James says being a murderer but not an adulterer doesn't make you a better person or less sinful. I think of it this way. My son, Corey, who, when he was young, was what I would call a spiller of beverages. Juice, Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, you name it, he'd spill it. And it'd be like, he'd carry a glass of milk into our den and I'd say, dude, don't bring that milk in here because if it spills, it's gonna be a mess. And guess what? He'd bring it in and it would spill. So imagine this, this hypothetical scenario. Imagine, imagine a loving, wise, incredibly handsome father says to his child, do not bring that milk into the den. Because it's going to spill. And if it does, it's going to be messy. And there are going to be consequences. But the child willfully brings the milk into the den and indeed spills it. So the father says, I told you not to bring the milk in here. But you did. Now you've spilled it and we have an issue. Well, suddenly, imagine the child who is quite bright, takes after their father, uh, suddenly becomes attorney-like and attempts to argue their own defense. And says, well, hold on, Father. It is true you decreed a no milk in the den law. However, it's equally true you issued other laws. For example, you said, do not hit your sister with a tennis racket. I did not vol violate that law. She is safe from my wrath. You told me to clean my room. This too I have, I have obeyed. You instructed me to feed the dog. I completed the task. She's a well-nourished canine. You told me to clear my place at dinner, at the dinner table, and I did, without objection, I might add. So I respectfully point out that you, Father, have issued a plethora of laws, and look at all the ones I've kept. I have but violated one little commandment. I am not a true lawbreaker. 
Therefore, I submit that in this milk-spilling incident, logic and leniency should prevail. I rest my case. Well, how does the father respond? I'll tell you how he responds. The father says, child, you're correct. It is I who said, do not hit your sister, clean your room, feed the dog, clear your dishes. But it's equally true that I, your loving progenitor, said, do not bring the milk into the den. Yet you did so willfully. And it's not so much I care about the spilled milk and the, and the violated law. What's most concerning to me, what's most hurtful, is that you violated me, your father, who loves you. And that is a sad and serious thing. Now, it's kind of funny, given that situation, I think we all understand the way that juvenile rebellion plays out in our families, and yet it often plays out the same way when it comes to God, our Heavenly Father. You know, James was stressing to Christians in the church that sin is sin is sin. It's all bad. But what we often do, like petulant children, is regard sins differently. You know, we view adultery and murder as super serious violations and then just kind of brush off the sins of favoritism, discrimination, and lack of love as no big deal. But it is a big deal. It's a big deal. Don't forget, Jesus said, next to loving God, the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So trying to convince ourselves that loving all people equally isn't that important is foolishly dismissive of what God says is right and good. Make no mistake, if we refuse to love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, it's, it's, it's a serious deal because when we violate people, we violate God, our Father, the one who identifies with, loves, and cares for all human beings made in his likeness. I mean, throughout the Old Testament, again and again and again, God, God takes up the cause of the poor, the unpopular, the marginalized, the weak, the disadvantaged, the underprivileged, and Jesus did the same. Which is why James was just so troubled by what he saw happening in the church. So he says to Christians, don't do it. Don't show favoritism. Don't discriminate against anyone. Don't sin. Instead, he says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Translation. James is saying to Christians, instead of just talking about being loving and gracious, be it, do it, speak and act. As who? As those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Or put another way, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you've experienced God's unconditional love and grace. You're forgiven and free from judgment. And just as God has loved and been gracious to you, you're to do the same to others. And by the way, James uses the term mercy here on purpose. He uses it because the Greek term for mercy implies action. You know, it's the outward manifestation of love and grace. Sometimes we hear the word, word mercy used and we think of being nice and friendly and gentle, but, but the New Testament term is, be, is used in, in a more specific sense. It's like when, when two blind guys cried out to Jesus, have mercy on us. Well, they, they weren't saying, be nice to us to sit and chat for a while. They weren't even asking Jesus to forgive their sins. They were saying, we need help. We have a physical need, and, and we've been culturally marginalized. Please have mercy. Take action to help us. And Jesus did. The same is true in the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, the Samaritan saw a stranger, an enemy, really, laying on the road, stripped, beaten, dying, and uh, he had mercy on the guy, meaning meaning that he didn't just feel bad and wave at him. No, mercy, by Jesus' definition, meant the Samaritan took action and cared for the man. So here's my point, which is ultimately Jesus' point and ultimately James' point. As Christians who have experienced the unconditional and impartial love of God, we should be demonstrating the same kind of love to others. And genuine love isn't theoretical. It's showing mercy. It's taking action to help others. It's about serving, sacrificing, giving, helping people in tangible, meaningful ways that are life-changing. In fact, James goes so far to suggest that anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus but doesn't show mercy may not be a true Christian. Now, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. James says it. He says it because in and through Jesus, God's love, his grace, and mercy changes us. It changes not only the way we think, but how we live, how we love, how we behave, 
how we act toward others. And that's what James means when he says judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who's not been merciful. I.e., if you don't, if you don't show mercy, you, you probably haven't experienced it. If you don't extend grace, you probably haven't experienced grace. If you refuse to love all people as yourself unconditionally and impartially, you may not really know the love of God, who himself is love. So clearly, this was something early Christians needed to hear and be challenged on, but you know, as I see it, the message of James is as relevant to the church in the 21st century as it was in the first century. Now, I don't know about you, but every day when I get up, I read the paper, I hear the news, or I get an alert on my phone, I'm, I'm reminded of the ever-increasing ugliness of our culture in which hate and violence, racism, anger, injustice, indifference, and contempt for one another has become the norm. And it's just so exhausting and it's so troubling to me. And I, and I can't help but wonder, where is the church in all of this? Where are followers of Jesus actually living like Jesus? Are we? You know, it seems that in, in, in many respects, the concern of the Christian church in our culture right now is more about ourselves than others. More about our own comfort than our community. More about politics than people. More about legal rulings than love which is something we constantly talk about. But here's, here's the reality. If the royal law in the Old Testament and the command of Jesus in the New Testament is to love all others as much as we love ourselves, even our enemies, if that's nothing more to us than a, a nice sentimental religious idea, then hate, prejudice, bigotry, and contempt for other people will come easy, especially toward those who look, talk, think, behave, and or believe differently than we do. But Jesus said, as his followers, it will be by our love that the world will know us, by our unconditional, impartial love. As Christians, is this how we're known in our community? Is that how we're known in our culture and in our world today? For our love? Because if not, it should be. For the sake of humanity, it needs to be. Let's pray. Our Father, in a world where love seems in short supply and hate seems to run rampant, I ask that you empower us by your Spirit to reject the evils of favoritism and prejudice and discrimination and instead, instead be a people of unconditional and impartial love, grace, and mercy. May we live every single day more and more like Jesus for the sake of our world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I really, I really feel like that song kind of captures the heart of Parkview. It really, it really is a, a summary of what we want uh, people to see and to know, not just about us, but about Jesus. And I'll tell you, over the past few months, we have just continued to be so blessed by your generosity because, uh, you know, we continue to be able to do things uh, like the Collective Academy and the other things that we talked about at the, the beginning of service, you know, classes and make a studio to, you know, increase our, our, our quality of content that we're producing. And all that comes back to the fact that we have people here that desperately want uh, the world around them to feel the presence of the Father's love. And so thank you for that. I also want to encourage you to continue to give uh, as you work through this season. Continue to give as we try to meet the needs in our community. We're so grateful for it. And many of you uh, give online and you give through the mail financially, which is such a blessing. But I'm also reminded today of, of the ways that people give that's generous but not financial. And what I'm really talking about is the handful of people that ran 20 miles yesterday uh, as they train for the marathon. That's not even happening, but they're training to still run a marathon to bring clean water uh, to kids in Africa. And so they went 20 miles, woke up crazy early in the morning, and they continue to train uh, for other people so that other people can feel the presence of the Father. It's incredible. It's incredible. So I just want to pray uh, a prayer of gratitude uh, for the ways that you continue to give and give so generously. So let's pray as we close our service. God, it's, as we talk about the generosity of our people, I'm, also, I'm always just struck by the fact that you're generous first. And we never will be able to outgive you. We never will be able to be more generous than you. In addition to giving us all the, th all, all the things that we see around us and life and breath and friendships and homes, you also ultimately gave us the gift of just you and your son. And we're so grateful for it. So, Father, thanks for such a, a place that reflects that generosity. Thanks for the ability to be generous and to use those gifts uh, to help others uh, feel the presence of your love. So we pray this all in your name. Amen.